the nuclear transformations. We got about halfway through all the different reactions last time uh, with the uh, nuclear decay, so we'll continue on with that. I've got lots of problems in the lecture that you can do on the, on the paper. Maybe you need to like flip it over or something if you printed it out. Um, but yeah, let's look at these nuclear transitions that we worked on last time. We did the alpha emission, beta emission, and positron emission. And then we kind of skipped past the, the electron capture and did annihilation. So looking at electron capture, I mentioned it briefly, but it's really for those, those uh, heavy elements that have large numbers of protons uh, because those 1s electrons are sucked in very close to the nucleus and there's a non-zero chance that they'll suck that electron in and, and be able to uh, move left in the periodic table. So you can look at uranium, you go left one slot and you're at protactinium. That's the result of electron capture. We went through the chart of the nuclides and showed like if it's, if it's got too many protons, what does it do? If it's got too many electrons, what does it do? Um, I'm not so much interested in testing you on predicting what's gonna happen. I just need you to know what the particles are and how to write out these reactions so that we can practice on some of those. Uh, here's some of the other reactions that, that uh, power our society. One is spontaneous fission. So again, the heavy elements that are beyond bismuth and lead, those are all radioactive and they can spit out alpha particles so they can get down to lead, a stable nucleus, um, but they can also just spontaneously break up and it's not quite a 50-50 arrangement, but there's a distribution of a bunch of different elements that they break into. And so this is an example of uranium-234 fissioning or, or breaking in half, roughly half, it's 54 and 38. So 54 protons fly off and take 131 neutrons with them and they make a xenon atom. And then the 38 protons that are left take off and that's a strontium atom. And it also, in this particular reaction, spits out two neutrons. Okay, now that's a very important point. Um, but spontaneous fission, I, I will say the products vary. <clears throat> and once they realize that uh, the products vary from these different spontaneous, uh, well, they used to call them transmutations, like the, the, the element would transmute into some other element, but now we just call it spontaneous fission. The thing that's spontaneous about it is, if you'll notice, there's only one reactant, and it's the uranium-234, and we do not know why this happens, or we can't predict when it's going to happen. We can do statistics and kind of learn what the probability is, but it just happens. It just falls apart, okay? And so without any external influence, that's what we mean by a spontaneous process. So you have enough of this element, it's going to be falling apart, making xenon and strontium, or really any two elements that add their protons up to 92. It can break apart in any of those ways. And this particular uranium isotope gives off two neutrons. Now that's really important because if, you, if that neutron hits another one of those elements, another nucleus, it can stimulate fission. So look at the difference here. These are two different processes, spontaneous fission versus stimulated fission. So notice there's two reactants. So that if this neutron comes in and slams into the uranium, it can create a, a more unstable or less stable uranium and then we can trigger this fission. And so then it can split apart, make a xenon and a strontium, and you get that neutron back plus two more. And so then it's produced a net gain of two neutrons. So one neutron in, two neutrons out, or really one in, three out, but it's doubling. This is fantastic because now those two neutrons can go and stimulate the fission of another couple of nuclei and double and double and double. And this can generate an enormous amount of power. If we can control those neutrons, then we can generate power from this in a controllable way. If we let those neutrons just go crazy and hit as many nuclei as possible, all that energy is released at once, and that's a nuclear weapon. So that's a nuclear bomb. So this stimulated fission 
It starts with spontaneous fission, and then you can stimulate the fission of other nuclei. And if you have a big enough mass of this uranium, the probability that those neutrons will hit another nucleus before they exit is greater than one, or it is one, you know, it's gonna hit. And, and, and then you're gonna have what to call a critical mass. If you have a small enough mass, the probability that they'll exit is higher than the probability that they'll hit something. And so it's just, just mass. That's all you gotta do is get enough of this element in a small space and you can release all of that energy at once. And so that was happening in the early, you know, they sort of discovered this uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And then all of the nations that had the technological capability to study these processes were starting to work on nuclear power and nuclear weapons. So all through, uh, they weren't advanced enough in World War I, but for World War II, obviously, uh, both um, uh, Germany, the US, Britain, um, Japan, and different places, they all had bomb programs. If you can take these uh, this neutron flux and direct those neutrons onto lithium and deuterium, you can increase the pressure on those two nuclei. And if you get them to touch, which is hard to do because you've got a proton on the deuterium and uh, three protons on the lithium, they repel each other and there's mostly space between them. If you can get them compressed enough to where they touch, then they'll fuse and make two helium nuclei. And that releases an enormous amount of energy. So we'll get into the energy thing. I think that's on Monday. It's either Friday or Monday. I have to look at the schedule. So just these are these are all of the different types of transform transitions. Now, maybe not all of them, but, but many of them. <clears throat> and so let's do some some uh, problems that il illustrate the main points. Yeah. Oh, good question. So a uh, deuterium is what we call heavy hydrogen. It's not on the periodic table. If you look, there's no D up there. And, and so this is just the traditional symbol we use for it, but it, it's really a hydrogen, which has one proton and two neutrons. So it's, it's hydrogen two. So hydrogen one would just be, uh, would be one proton, one nucleon, and so that's that's normal hydrogen, which is you know like 99% of the hydrogen on Earth. But then there's some heavy hydrogen. Uh, they would collect it with heavy water, so there's a chance that you'd have water with the heavy hydrogen on it, and that was a way to purify this deuterium. Um, there's also tritium, which is radioactive, which would be H1 with with two neutrons, so it's got three nucleons, so that's tritium. And so that's the radioactive hydrogen. It's pretty radioactive too. I think the half-life is around 12 years. So let's do some main concept review. Symbols, symbols, symbols. So what is the symbol for an electron? So in the past, we just draw an E with like a negative sign on it. But what are the, what are the prefixes that we put on that? Yeah, it's not a nuclear particle. It's not a nucleon, so it's a zero up here. And in these reactions, it counts as sort of an antiproton. It takes away one proton when it reacts, okay? A beta particle is the same as an electron, but we typically use that Greek character, beta, okay? I mean, you can put the minus charge on there, but the, the, the charge of these particles is pretty irrelevant in terms of the energy, right? So it's, uh, yeah. Okay, then a positron. So that that what is what is a positron? Like, Good question. Yeah, what is, what does that even mean? Yeah, so it's a positive <laughs> electron. Yeah, so it's it's an electron here. It's a, not a nucleon, but it does count as a positive particle, like when it when it um, reacts in a nuclear manner with a nucleus. Okay. Then the alpha particle. So we can designate that with the Greek character alpha. What are the numbers for this one? Nope, so the zeros ones, yeah, four and two. So it has four particles and two of those are protons, okay? And if we look at the periodic table, 
two protons is the same as a helium nucleus. And so you could also write an alpha particle like this, helium-4. <clears throat> okay, what about a neutron? We know a neutron is in the nucleus, and so it's got a one up here. It's a nucleon, so there's a one up there. But when it interacts with protons and positrons and electrons, what does it do? Zero. Yeah, it doesn't, so it's a zero down here. So it doesn't change the proton count at all. Okay, and then a proton, we can signify that with a little, a lowercase p. It is a particle in the nucleus, so it's a one up here in the superscript. And then in the proton reactions, when we're balancing the protons, it's a proton, so it's a plus one down here. And then just for grands, let's do carbon-14. So let's put it all together for carbon-14. Remember, this 14 is the mass number, so that's up here. We don't need in our little sort of the way you would write this out in text, we don't need to specify the number of protons. Why? We can write it out in the symbol, but in terms of typing it out, we don't have to specify the number of protons because carbon has six protons. I always mean, check myself so I don't make some stupid mistake. So six protons. So the carbon and the six essentially are the same information. But if we're writing out the symbols, that's what you would write. It's carbon 14 is 14 and a six. Carbon 13 is 13 and a six. Carbon 12 is a 12 and a six. You know, so those are all isotopes of carbon. All right, let's turn up the heat. I wish I could, but um, let's combine a positron emission with an annihilation interaction. So positron emission, that was the carbon 6, 11, right? And an emission, it's just gonna um, spit out a positron. So a positron was a, a plus one down here and a zero. And then we need to figure out what the numbers are. So over here on the right would be 11, because 11 plus zero is 11. And then something plus one is equal to six. That would be a five, right? Five plus one is equal to six. So then we go to the periodic table and we see that that's boron. So that is the positron emission, one of an example of a positron emission reaction. And now let's combine that with an annihilation reaction. So what do I mean by combine? Well, just like our half reactions we had for redox reactions, you can write reactions above each other and then just add them down. So what is the, what are the reactants on an annihilation reaction? An electron, and a an electron and a positron. So we have two E's here, but they have different symbols. Okay, one is a positron, so we have a plus one zero and a minus one zero. So that's a positron on the left and an electron on the right. And that's gonna produce two gamma rays, which are zero and zero. Okay, and so yeah, zero plus zero is zero, and plus one minus one equals zero. So the balance, everything balances. And so when it says combine, we're going to combine everything and cancel stuff that's on the left and the right. So over here we have carbon 11 plus an electron gives a boron 11 plus two gamma rays. So I just wanted to show you this, that you can combine these reactions just like we do all of our chemical reactions. <clears throat> you can cancel the things that are that are similar like this, these positrons here can be canceled. Uh, this happens so fast that this is really what we see down below. As soon as that positron comes out, it finds an electron because they're attracted to each other, they have the same mass, they can react instantly, they hit and spit out two gamma rays. Okay. So let's take uranium-235 and let's balance it to krypton 
and produce two neutrons. So this is spontaneous fission. That means that on the left side of the arrow is only one thing. That's the uranium. This is uranium-235. So you should be able to write that out pretty quickly. Uranium-235, 92 protons. And there's a whole lot of stuff that is in this reaction, and we're given very little information, but we're given just enough. So we know the krypton here, okay? Krypton. How many protons does krypton have? Look at your periodic table. Louder, please. 36? Okay. 36 and two neutrons. So we have two of these, a neutron, which is a zero down here and a one up there. Okay. <clears throat> and w there's no way to balance this with just these things. So what else do we have to have? If, if uranium spits out a krypton, what else is it going to have? What's 92 minus 36? Fifty-six? Okay, thank you. Fifty-six. So then we go to the periodic table and we find fifty-six. Barium. Okay, very good. Barium. So we've got the, the protons are balanced. Okay. What do we do with the with the mass numbers? Okay. Here it's is it's kind of uncertain, right? So there could be lots of answers on this. So go to the go to Krypton and, and look at the mass. What is the mass on Krypton? Let me get my yeah, so we look at our periodic table and 83.8, pretty close to 84. And that's pretty close to the mass, 84. And then barium is 137, okay? So um, let's just do Krypton. We'll say we'll say 84 for the Krypton. And then we just balance everything out. So I've got 235 from the uranium. And on the right-hand side, I've got 84. So I'm just going to subtract, see what's left, minus 84. And then I'm going to subtract two for the two neutrons. And what's left? So five minus four is one, minus one. So that's going to be nine, because I had to borrow one. So then I've got 12 minus eight, which is four. So 149. Does everybody follow that? So I just had to have all of those top numbers equal 235. OK. <clears throat> and so that's, I mean, that's pretty far away from 137, but not unreasonable. OK. So that's the, we've balanced the spontaneous uh, fission of uranium-235. And, you know, if we, in energy-wise, we would probably have some gamma rays, right? But this is optional, <laughs> right? Because the gamma has a zero and a zero, so we only know it's there because of energy. Yes? Yeah, so I could have said barium uh, um, 137 and then figured out what isotope of krypton I had. But it's going to be something different than both of those. So this is either one would work. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Yes. Uh, let's say, uh, so like the molar ratio of like the two neutrons, right? Let's say it was like two kryptons. Mm -hmm. Does that change? Um, yeah, so I guess. <sighs> This is where I'm sort of bumping up against the limit of my knowledge. I don't know if there's reactions that would produce three nuclei, like two kryptons and something else, but you're going to have to have a balance. The rest would not be all neutrons. It would be some other element. And so you would subtract two uh, 84s from that, which would be 168, and then you'd have quite a few protons left over, which would be a third element. I don't know. It's all probabilities, right? And so that might occur, but it would probably be less probable than just producing two nuclei. But again, I'm at the end, end of my knowledge on that, so I really don't know. Uh, but you would just balance it all out. You have two kryptons and whatever the balance of protons 
is that would be the other element yeah it's a good question now in terms of the two neutrons versus one neutron or three um, that again is uh, um, uh, the nature of these different types of reactions so they they had a lot of they were doing research on the different nuclei to see how many neutrons they produced and they finally found uranium-235 produced two no neutrons for every one end. So they knew that that particular isotope of uranium was perfect for uh, sustained energy or sustained like, runaway reaction for a bomb. So that's why we had to purify the uranium-235 away from the natural ore. It was uh, like 99.6 uh, or something percent uranium-238. And so we had to sort out like four out of every thousand atoms and separate those to make enriched uranium. So enriched uranium is enriched in uranium-235, the thing that produces a flux of two neutrons for every one in. And we'll get into the energy thing uh, in, the, in the future. Okay, okay so let's uh, look at stimulated uh, emission or stimulated fission of uranium-235 to molybdenum. So in a nuclear reactor, we have stimulated emission, and molybdenum is a really useful, um, uh, you know, radiological medicine drug, okay, or medicine nuclide. So 235, 92, stimulated fission, so we have a neutron, and we get three neutrons out. And then the molybdenum, MD, okay, and the, where is it, manganese, oh, it's MO, sorry, I screwed that up, I was like, that didn't look right, molybdenum, and we're at 42 protons, so we go to the periodic table, molybdenum is 42, let's go ahead and balance our protons, so we subtract 42 from the uh, 92, and that gives us 50, is that right? Okay, 50, so then we find nucleus 50 on here, which is 10. So, Okay, so there's the, the protons are balanced. This is the main players in this reaction. And 10 is 119, so let's just choose that one. 10 is 119 as our mass number. And then we find molybdenum uh, by the difference. So um, this is uranium-235 plus one. So on this side, we have 236. And on this side, we have 119, 120, 121, 122. So 122 is what we have. So we subtract that from 236. Six minus two is four, three minus two is one. one. So 114 would be our molybdenum one, and it's 96, it's not unreasonable, but 114 would be the isotope of molybdenum produced if we produced a 119.10. Yes? Probably molybdenum. Um, I didn't know that. How would I find that in periodic table? I didn't know I could test Oh, molybdenum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's just, <laughs> I guess, knowledge of the periodic table, right? So I just put, I just threw some elements in here. Yeah, so I would, um, I'll try to, I'll try to give you ones that like barium and krypton, things that you can easily find. Okay. And so then let's balance the fusion reaction where the uranium-238 absorbs an alpha particle. So that's also a possibility. It's not one we've covered on any of the pages so far. So let's just look at, at what's being said here grammatically. So we have uranium-238, and it says absorbs an alpha particle. That has to be a reactant, right? It's absorbing an alpha particle. It's reacting with it. So we're going to add an alpha particle to this. And then we'll see what we get. So 92 plus 2 is 94. So then we go to the periodic table, and we see 94 is plutonium, Pu. 
Okay, and then 238 plus 4 is going to be 242. And so that would be the fusion reaction where uranium absorbs an alpha particle. And that happens in, uh, in nuclear reactors. So some types of nuclear reactors convert uranium to plutonium. And so you put in depleted uranium, uranium-238, sort of as a target, and you can build up amounts of plutonium and make more nuclear fuel in the nuclear reactor. These are called breeder reactors. They actually breed and make more fuel as they generate heat. So that's fantastic. Not only are we getting energy out that could be used to make electricity, the, the reactor is producing fuel that can be used in the future. So it's, it's really amazing. It also is producing some things that have to be separated out. They're neutron absorbers. Some of these xenon isotopes will absorb the neutrons and sort of poison the fuel. And so we take those out, reprocess the fuel, pull out the plutonium, and then we can put that back in as fuel. Okay, now let's balance the fusion reaction of two deuterium atoms. So deuterium, uh, a lot of times this is in molecular form. So I'm just going to go ahead and write it this way, um, D2, right? Instead of H2, I'm going to write D2. Uh, each of those deuteriums has one proton and two, uh, two total particles in the nucleus. So one proton, one neutron. And if I fuse both of those together, I end up with the helium 4, 2, plus a big gamma ray. <laughs> you don't know that, but it's true. It gives off a lot of energy. Um, uh, we could have written this another way. We could have written it as uh, 2D1 plus 2D1 gives a helium 2, 4, or 4, 2. So it's, aside from the fact maybe you have an element on here that you're not as familiar with, um, it's pretty straightforward. Balance the protons first, the proton row, then balance the mass numbers, and it and it's, it's pretty easy. It's kind of fun. It's better than Sudoku again. I like that. It's like a puzzle. Okay, let's talk about radiation measurements. So we, we saw that, that nice little um, video of the cloud chamber. Here's one you can buy if you've got money burning a hole in your pocket. Um, it doesn't have, have to listen to classical music, but um, you know it makes that super saturated amount of, of alcohol. You know the little cloud. Uh, it's got a little frame on there. It's like a refrigeration unit to create the the cold environment. He puts some alcohol in there. Let me skip ahead, and it puts it all back together. There's some LED lights, and then you zoom in with the camera through the side of the box, and he drops a little pebble of uranium in there and you can see the cloud form so there it is sitting there and it's radioactive glory and see the clouds oh. those particles are shooting out of that that's that, not a special effect no that's actually happening that you're seeing the the alpha particles and some beta particles coming out of that uranium Whoa. it's so neat yeah and look how far some of them go it's really cool now, the uranium, this is an ore. It's probably been around many, many years, billion years, I don't know. But there's daughter elements. Remember the very last slide on the last video, they went down the periodic table until they got to lead. Halfway through there is radon gas, which is a noble gas. Most of these elements are stuck in oxides, like it's a, it's a, it's a mineral. So there's oxygen in there holding on to those metals. But guess what happens when it becomes radon? All of those covalent bonds break because radon doesn't care. It's a noble gas. And so it percolates its way through and it comes out of the out of the rock. Is and, that still uranium? And so now this is a little different. I forget what it is. Um, it, it says. But look over here. See these particles shooting around over here on the right? Where's my pen? Anyway, I'll do it with a mouse. Over here on the right, there's occasionally a random splash or flash through here that's not related to the material and that's radon gas so radon gas is floating around and then it just spits out an alpha particle randomly over here or randomly over here or randomly in your lungs <laughs> yeah and oh. and radon gas is like 14 percent of lung cancers yeah it triggers yeah that's a huge percent so anyway it's pretty interesting you can see um different samples um 
some of them are really giving off low energy electrons. Like the, you can see the paths um, that are really tortured because they're colliding with the gases. So let me see. So the point is, oh yeah, oh. look at that. Yeah. I think that's radon gas. If you read the, in the description of the video. So they got radon gas in there and it's just decaying everywhere. So like if you live in a place with uh, a lot of uranium in the rocks, and we don't because it's not underneath Texas really, but Montana, Pennsylvania, those places. Uh, and you, in the 70s, we discovered, oh, energy efficient, let's seal up our homes. Well, this radon was percolating through the concrete and collecting in the basements. And you go down the basement and you do your laundry and you're breathing in radioactive gas and you get lung cancer. And so now in those places, they have uh, ventilation in the basements and they have radon monitors to measure how much radon is accumulating in the basements. Um, but that's the cool thing about radioactivity is that you can detect it. So here's a, a detector, a radiation detector. It's a, a Ludlum detector. It's a scintillation detector. Let's look at those, um, how these work. So um, <clears throat> this is just a different kind of probe. What's shown on the screen is a pancake probe. What's shown down here on the bottom right is a is a, a, a GM probe or Geiger-Muller probe. You've heard of Geiger counters. That's what this is. And so you can point this at the radioactive source, and it creates an ionized gas inside that's really easy for the, the detection system to detect. <clears throat> so the, the beta particle or alpha particle goes through a thin plastic window, gets into the, the chamber, which has a, a vacuum in it and a high voltage, and a little spark shot, shoots across and makes a tick sound, and then you can count too. You can count how many little ticks happen per second. So I got one of these. It's a smaller version. This big one doesn't work because there's a special rechargeable battery in there that that is broken. But I've got this one, a little educational one from Vernier Scientific, and it's um, and so you can see that it's it's measuring zero really. But if I had this Fiesta wear plate, which is using uranium oxide as a pigment, they produced this in the 60s or early or late 50s. And oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So that's what you hear. They like that, that sound that you're familiar with. And you can see that it's, the numbers are going up. And that's counts per second. So that's the activity that it's picking up. So that's really radioactive? It really is. Yeah, it's in the trick. Yeah. <laughs> no no and you can calculate the dose and we'll talk about the doses in a minute but yeah it's so easy to detect you can detect it from a distance even and this is also like 466 counts per minute if i had just turned this on and set it down after a minute or two it would give us the background in here and it's around 11 to 13 counts per second so just being in the room in any room uh you get radioactivity from the air, from radon, from cosmic rays in the atmosphere, from concrete and the elements in the concrete. But then some substances like uranium are more radioactive than, than you know, or concentrated in this case. It's, a, it's uranium oxide. It gives it that orange color. And so they liked that color. They weren't afraid of radioactivity at the time. And so they made this glaze for Fiesta wear. It's like the Pirates glasses where, like, I don't know, I haven't seen a lot on Oh, yeah, you can do, yeah. Yeah, some of the glass fluoresces. Now, um, this is a um, smoke detector. This is the guts of a smoke detector. And you don't want your smoke detector uh, detection mechanism to, to necessarily be powered, right? Because if something happens to the power, then you can't detect if there's a fire. So this uses a radioactive source and alpha particles, which are really easy to block because they're really big. Think of that nu nu helium nucleus flying through, through air. Just a, a, I mean, you know, maybe a, an inch of air is enough to stop those alpha particles. And so I can set this in front of the little spot right there. This is americium in it. And here's my Geiger counter. I put it in front. It's not really detecting anything because air is stopping those alpha particles. Oh, yeah. So alpha particles are stopped by air pretty easily. See how much it drops off? And so that's shielding. The air is shielding the, the alpha particles. It's stopping them. But you get too close. Yeah. Now this one this one might um, like cause you some health effects if you ate it. 
but you but you it's not strong enough especially if i if i stay an inch away from the actual source and we have dead skin and that's enough to stop those alpha particles but we don't have dead skin in our lungs or in our stomach or whatever so if you ate it then it's going right into your tissues and creating all these other reactions okay yeah so outside your body radiation you know some of the radiation penetrates beta particles penetrate more than alpha particles um, but anyway that's detection of radiation um, this is using the Geiger Mueller tube you can also have what's called a scintillation detector detector so if the high energy photons like gamma rays or the alpha particles come into uh, these these salts like cesium iodide gallium uh, sodium iodide so that's this salt uh, the interaction with those high energy particles will create light in that salt. So the light, the salt will be perturbed and excited and it'll emit light. And then you just put a really uh, very sensitive light detector on there. So the window of this light detector is looking at the salt window and the salt window is looking at the radioactive particles. And so a tiny little flash of light is called a scintillation. And this is a scintillation detector. And, and it's really great, very sensitive. Okay. Now, how do we, what are the units of radiation? Um, there's lots, okay? This is sort of extra information for you. The one we're going to use in class is going to be things like counts per minute or counts per second. So this is the one that we're really interested in. And this is focused on our detector. So these are detector counts. Um, these top ones are based upon the actual element, so the number of disintegrations of the nucleus per second. Really hard to know that value because you'd have to detect in all directions, right? When the nucleus disintegrates, it goes off in an angle. And so you would have to know the solid angle of collection before you could say that there's that many disintegrations in this ore per second. So it's, these top ones are kind of hard. Uh, there's a lot of uh, geometry involved in coming up with that number. But for the detector, I can just stick the detector in front of something and see how many detector counts I have per second. Okay, and, and it'll be proportional to those top two, but it won't be exactly the same. And then we have exposure numbers, um, which would be how much radiation is actually absorbed by my body. So these alpha particle, I'm not getting a high radiation dose from this because that, that radioactivity is not making it through the air and not making it through my dead skin. It's getting stopped. Um, beta particles would be a higher exposure and it would be actually going into my body and being absorbed. But gamma rays might be going right through my body. And so again, there's sort of a profile of which a body will absorb radiation. It's very similar to the profile of water. Why is that? Why, oh, because what is our body? Oh, it's 70% water. Yeah, so if, if we look at the profile of water and how it absorbs radioactivity, that's pretty much what we're going to be absorbing. Yeah. So then, um, with those, like that one incident in Japan where like these three workers were exposed to, I think they saw like a blue flash and then they immediately started vomiting. And they were already dead. That was dead. with the stirring of the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were yeah. already dead, but they were still alive for a while. How does that work? They were, they had received a lethal dose, but they weren't dead. Yeah. They, they received, just like if you ate poison, you're like, oh, dang, you know, make myself throw up. <laughs> but, but it's still in your body. Um, you're going to die. All their cells died. That like, they, like all their cells in their body just died. Like they kept one person alive for like, nice yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. I'll send it to you. Yeah, send it to me. That's interesting. <laughs> But no, the, no like, but think about a sunburn. A lot of this is, is just cell damage, just like you get from UV light from the sun. So what happens to your skin when you get a really bad burn? Um, the skin dies, it gets necrotic, and then you have a, a response. You have swelling, you have uh, blood vessels and so on. Uh, basically, your body's responding to a burn. This can happen inside your body with a huge dose. You can, you can hit certain organs and so on that absorb that. And a small amount, a small dose, your body can react to. Just like you get a small sunburn, it's sore for a little bit. Maybe your white blood count goes up a little. Um, if you get a really bad sunburn, maybe you get nauseous and so on. It's your body's response to that burn 
that that's making you sick. So radiation sickness is really just a response to the the dead cells that the radiation has caused. Um, so let's look at the kinetics of radioactive decay. So spontaneous radioactive decay is a first order process. And so the A's in these here's these uh, equations can can re, you know represent the activity in whatever units you're interested in. So a lot of times we're dealing with counts per second. And so these would go in here. This would be the initial. And this is the counts per second after time t, right? So you go a certain time, that's the new activity in counts per second. So it's, it's not that difficult. Let's do an example of this for radioactive dating. So we have carbon-14 dating to date things that, that once, were, once were alive or interacted with the biosphere. So carbon-14 is not one of the naturally occurring nuclei. It's actually generated from nitrogen in the atmosphere. So there's a large amount of nitrogen-14 in the atmosphere. It's the most abundant form of nitrogen. And then as it gets higher in the atmosphere, UV light hits it and breaks it apart. So then you have nitrogen atoms. So vacuum UV light comes in, breaks those sigma bonds, and we have uh, nitrogen atoms, CN2, and now it's N, okay? Then cosmic rays hit that, which are, are like alpha particles and protons and so on that are just streaming out of the sun from the fusion reactions at the sun. So those are cosmic rays. They excite that nitrogen, which then spits out a positron and becomes a carbon, okay? And so this produces a near constant amount of CO2 in the atmosphere because now we have a carbon-14 in the atmosphere. It's reactive, it finds oxygen, makes CO2 in the atmosphere. And then plant respiration will suck that CO2 out of the atmosphere and produce oxygen and it holds onto that carbon-14. So that plants have carbon-14 in them. We eat plants or we eat animals that eat plants. <laughs> and so there's carbon-14 in our bodies as well. And so when respiration stops, the animal or the plant dies, and then you have the carbon-14 decay over time. So this is how we date once living things and wood from campfires and so on. You're in a you know, national forest, you come across a, you know, a, maybe a, a, you know, a native campground, you can dig around and find the charcoal from the fire and you can date that with carbon-14 and see how long ago that fire was, um, or actually when that, that tree or whatever that wood died. So here's the kinetics of that. A wooden object from an archeological site is subjected to radiocarbon dating. The activity of the sample is uh, it's measured at 11.6 disintegrations per second and the activity of a carbon sample of equal mass from fresh wood is 15.2 disintegrations per second. And then we look up the half-life of carbon-14 and it's 5,015 years. What's the estimated age of this sample? So we have the half-life, but we need to get the, the to use this uh, equation, we need the rate constant here. And so we'll just use this half-life equation to get the rate constant. So the natural log of two divided by 5,715 years gives us the rate constant. Okay. And then we put everything in this top equation and solve for T. So again, this is the natural log of a fraction that's less than one, so that's gonna be a negative result. And we have a negative sign over here, so the negative signs cancel. We divide that result by 1.21 times 10 to the minus 4. And we're dividing by inverse years, so years comes up to the top. So it gives us the time in years. And so this object was 2,233 years old. Okay. Do you see the assumption, though? What is the assumption here in this radiocarbon dating? That the... Um, the specimen's going to be within the, the year limit, the half-life? It could be longer than the half-life. It could be. Um, One of two? <laughs> yeah. Um, here, this is the assumption here, this A0. That's the amount of carbon-14 activity in that wood when it was alive. 
but we couldn't go back there and get it. So we took fresh wood of equal mass. I mean, you got to do something, right? So this is A0 from fresh wood. So we're saying that the carbon-14 percentage in wood today is the same as it was 2,000 years ago and so on. So that's the one assumption. And, you know, is it good or bad? I mean, it is what it is. It'll give us some error bars on there. And so, uh, but that is the assumption that how do we know what the the fresh wood was back then? And this, again, would be kind of a drastic change. Our atmosphere would have to change. The flux from the sun would have to change. The activity of the plants and so on. So, um, which one of these is most dangerous? <laughs> so, so, here's our decay constants. Here's our half lives. I think in half lives, I, the decay constants are just a number to me. So, look at the half lives and tell me which one of these elements do you think is the most dangerous? The top one? It's, that's one option. So, the top one, mm -hmm. the bottom one might be the, you know, so we have, uh, raise your hand if you think it's the bottom one. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's the top one. It's about 50-50, okay. Um, so this is how long it takes for half of that sample to decay away. So this is telling you how radioactive it is sort of in the inverse, right? If it takes 14 billion years for half of that sample to decay away, only a little of it is decaying at any one minute, right? With iodine, it takes eight days for half of that sample to decay away. So if I've got a gram of radioactive iodine, half of that is going to be hitting me in eight days with radioactivity. So the bottom one is really radioactive, okay? But that there's another factor, too. Um, I said outside my body is different than inside my body. What if I ingest one of these? <laughs> If I ingest iodine, okay, it's going to be I minus, and it's going to be water soluble, and I'm going to pee it out, hopefully long before eight days is up, <laughs> right? It's going to go through me pretty quick because it's water soluble. Which one of these elements is fairly radioactive and is not going to get peed out immediately? It might get stuck in my body. The heavy metals, yeah, they might get stuck. Um, but they're not very radioactive. So one of the, the bottom three rows are the more radioactive ones, okay? And look at strontium in the periodic table. What column is it in? Second one. What else is in that column that's physiologically relevant? Calcium. Calcium. Strontium can get stuck in your bones, Ooh. just like calcium. It's a chemical substitute. So if you get contaminated with strontium-90, that can get incorporated into your bones. And it's most dangerous to those who are making new bone, like infants, like developing you know, babies in the womb and so on. So that's a really dangerous process. So the most dangerous one on this chart is strontium-90. Yeah. It's not the most radioactive on the chart, but it's the one that could be incorporated the easiest in the body. Would it's going it to show up in breast milk. It's going to show up in cattle milk. It's going to show up in bones. Yeah. Would it also be able to replace magnesium? Yes, it would. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a rule of thumb. Like how long would these last? Uh, this is real short. The, it, 10 times a half life is a good rule of thumb for how long this is going to last. So let's say some really bad actor blew up a strontium 90 bomb in Houston. OK, and scattered that garbage all over the place. We'd have to wait 10 half lives for it to um, go away. So 300 years. Yeah. Whereas, you know, plutonium, 24,000, 240,000 years. Uh, iodine, uh, eight day, 80 days. So you can just take that half life and multiply by 10. That's how long it would take to get down to one thousandth of its current level of radioactivity okay so that's why we're worried about dirty bombs they're more like area exclusion bombs you contaminate the place so bad that you just don't want to go there you'd have to clean it up dr dramatically yeah the good thing about the cleanup is it's radioactive and you can follow it around with your geiger counter and you can know is this place clean or not yeah okay it's clean it's below detection all right 
And so then we'll, we'll continue on next time. There's another problem here in the notes. Um, there it is. If you want to watch the video, uh, we're done. Yeah. So last semester, I was, I was hospitalized and I was uh, critically low on potassium. Okay. So they had to 